And if you can transition from B to G. Good morning. Welcome everyone to Chris Fellowship. Glad you're here with us this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. It sure does feel different outside. In a good way. In a good way. Hey, just a few things to talk about. Uh, first of all, uh, we're glad you're here. But... Uh, we got a great day planned today. We're going to have a baptism. This is, I think this is our first baptism since COVID, but we decided we're going to trust God and dip them. So, but it's really good to see, and I'm excited for that. Pastor will be doing that here in a minute. Uh, he has started back his uh, men's Bible study on Tuesday mornings at Parcells. Um, he encourages you to plug into that. It starts at 8 a.m. Is that right? 8 a.m. At, Par at Parcells. And uh, so men, you're invited to that. Uh, there's an ushers and security uh, team meeting uh, scheduled for October 1st right here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. So please mark that on your calendar if you're part of those teams. Uh, of 
Of course, I want to remind everyone that the, the yard sale we started this week for Chris Fellowship School, of course, things are different because they didn't have the 400-mile yard sale back in June over the whole state, but uh, that's going to be going on. They're taking donations. I don't know where they're putting them because it's full, but we, we regardless, we want your stuff to sell to somebody else, okay? And, and then you can come buy some of their stuff, Phil, Okay. But uh, please participate in that. If you have things that you would like to donate, uh, Mr. Rowley's uh, phone number is in the bulletin. Just give him a call and set that up with him. Um, I want to remind everyone on Wednesday nights we're having worship and warfare right here in the sanctuary from 7 to 8. And everyone's invited to that. That's been going very, very well. Also, CFS Senior Class is doing a fundraiser for uh, Texas Roadhouse. The details of how you can participate with that are in the bulletin. I can just say that the Wagners have participated. <laughs> can I have a date with you? All right. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Hey, and today is just a great big day. At our, we got a birthday party at our house. Oliver's too. And I love being poppy. I can just tell you right now, I love being poppy. All right. I don't know of any. Oh, loving Benton back to life. Loving Benton to Life is uh, Tuesday the 22nd of October from 7 to 9. The, thank you, April. That's why you're here helping me. This Tuesday from 7 to 9 at the Benton Resiliency Center on the square, Brother Damien will be leading worship there, and uh, everyone's invited out for that. Right now, if everyone can stand, we're going to pray for some folks in our church family that need to touch from God. And again, it, it really is good to see everybody. We're glad you're here. So glad you're here. Well, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you're so, so good to us. Right now, Lord God, uh, as we gather together in your name, Father God, I just pray that the name of the Lord Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords will be glorified today at Christian Fellowship, Father. God, we lift up our pastor to you. Our, our folks that are working in kids' ministry today, Lord Jesus. And we just pray you anoint them, empower them to glorify Jesus. And right now we pray for our worship team as they lead today. Empower them. And I just pray that together we will glorify and lift up the King of kings and Lord of lords. Father God, we lift up uh, Lori uh, Col Colburn to you, Lord God. Judy Runkle, we just come against cancer in Jesus' name. We know you, Lord Jesus. Uh, bore stripes on your back for the healing of our bodies and we speak that over them right now in Jesus name by your stripes they are healed continue to touch Emily Dolworth give her good reports encourage her give her strength in Jesus name thank you for good reports for Aiden Cox this week and uh, God we give you thanks for that uh, for Mammy Jones continue to touch her and uh, help her to be a witness for your goodness God continue to touch Hunter Crumb Orville Howard, Bob Wright, Father God, give them strength in their bodies. In Jesus' name, we pray for a miracle for Hunter. God, we pray for doctors to have wisdom and for the healing hand of God to touch that young boy. In Jesus' name, continue to touch Adam Tarnowski. Give the doctors wisdom. I, tell you, I pray you take away every symptom that he's battling right now. In Jesus' name, continue to touch Megan Clope. Strengthen her heart. Father God, take away any disease or infection. In Jesus' name, we thank you for that, Lord God. Right now, together in this place, we lift up holy hands to you. You alone are worthy. And right now, Father God, enter into this place. Help us to lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans 8, 28 say, And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. Do you love God? Do you love God? So all things work together for good for those that love God. To those who are the call according to His purpose. Are you in His purpose? Okay, I guess, uh, uh, let me go back. Do you love God then? All right, let's keep it that way. We work with the purpose later, all right? So let's, let's sing this song understanding that all things work together for good for those that love God. The one that might be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness.
against all the world prevail. Cause I got us so and no only how to try it. And I've got will never. Let's sing again the weapon might be former. Come on and confess that. The weapon might be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness fails, they won't prevail. Yes, because the God has sent knows only how to try it. My God will never fail. Yes, I know they might. Oh my God, we'll never fail. I wanna see you victory. I wanna see you victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I wanna see you victory. I wanna see you victory. For the The battle belongs to you, Jesus. So come on this morning, whatever it is that you have been battling, whatever it is that the enemy has been telling you that is bigger than your God, it's time to put it in his hands because absolutely everything, everything that rises against you, God will turn it for good. Come on in from the beginning and say the weapon. The weapon might be formed. When the darkness fails, it won't be there. Cause the God I serve no only kind of triumph. But my God will never fail. I believe it, I believe it. That my God will never fail. I'm gonna see you. power that you believe in, there is power in the mighty name of Jesus. <laughs> Everywhere he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this will be. Yes, I know.
what the word of God said that he does that. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And we know that all things work together for good for those that love God. And we know that all things work together for good for those that love God. Yes. And we turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm going to seek a victory. I'm going to seek a victory for the seated for just a moment guys I hope you guys are having church out there because we sure have been having it in here Whew, man even if it does feel like a sauna whoo <laughs> she's warm hey joy why don't you come up here and stand on the stage with me as I do uh as she does it's it's time to get back to business church it's time to see the lost saved and baptized it's time to see People filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's time to see the sick healed, the captive delivered, and uh, we're getting back to business. And uh, this young man right here, God has just been absolutely, in a good way, I don't say this negatively, ripping his life apart and just absolutely moving in his heart. He came to me, I've gotten to know Wyatt the past couple of months, and uh, he came to me one Sunday and said, 
I got to get baptized. He said, God is doing something. I just want him to have everything. And when somebody wants to get baptized and give the Lord everything, you baptize them and you give the Lord everything. And uh, amen. Give the Lord. We've been talking about what God's been doing in his life. And this guy's just sold out for Jesus. And he wants him to have it all. I asked Joy up here for a reason. She didn't know I was going to do this. But he also goes to uh, Sunday night, what we call the community. It's a group of young believers. I, they're not so young anymore, but just on fire for the Lord. And Joy is a leader in that group. And I wanted her to pray over Wyatt before I baptized him. Can I put my hand up? Yeah, okay. Lord Jesus, I just ask that as Wyatt um, comes to you, Lord, he's making this public declaration of his faith, Father, that you would bless him and rise him, raise him up, Father, to be a man of God and to be a leader, Lord. Um, Lord, just bless his heart for missions, Father, that you've called him to, God. Just make that calling more and more clear as he grows, Lord. Um, but, Father, we're just so excited to see what you have in store for him, Lord. And we thank you for bringing him here, that we um, as a community and as this body has a responsibility, Father, to help him in his walk, God. And I commit myself to helping him in that. And um, I'm asking you all to commit to that with me. That we would be his, we would be there to uphold his arms, Lord, um, and we just thank you for this public declaration of faith, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Miss Joy. Whew, this is exciting. Well, Wyatt, upon the confession of your faith, I happily baptize you in the name of Jesus, as He commanded, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. with us this morning. That's what we pray. The more will come, Father, to make that declaration that they put they trust in you, that they choose to build their life upon your word, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. Worthy. Come on and say with me, worthy. Worthy of every song you could ever. Open up my eyes. 
worthy of every song we could ever see. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name of our every other. Jesus, the only one we could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
there is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and feel with your heart and lead me in love to those around me. Fill us with your love, Jesus. Fill us with your presence, Jesus.
guys while we're still standing I want us to have a corporate prayer and pray into something had a request this week and I'm just going to read the message from Leanne and Reed Lamb says I hope you're doing well Uh, we would like everybody to please pray a special prayer Sunday for Roman which is their new baby Um, they're leaving today for two full days of appointments he has a neurologist visit to determine if he has to have surgery on his spinal column that leads to brain surgery. So they're facing some difficult things today, and I'm sure all of us can just imagine the horror and the fear that would try to creep in as a parent, you know. So can we just pray over that baby today and over the peace of the Holy Spirit to just invade that situation? Father, right now in Jesus' name, as we come before you, Lord, we lift up, we lift up the lamps. We lift up Reeve and Leanne and Roman, Father, and Gary and Karen and Jim and Carol and everybody, Father, that's attached to this situation. Lord, we ask you right now for your name to be glorified, Father, and your healing hand to touch that baby boy right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I know a lot of things have been spoken, but we take up this stance that we choose to trust you, Lord. You're the great physician. You are the one that paid the price by the stripes on your back for little Romans healing. And we pray as a corporate body, as a family, and we gather around them right now and lift them up. And we speak healing into that little baby right now in Jesus' name. We pray that as they go for these tests the next couple of days, 
that it would be positive results, that fear would not creep in, but that the peace of God would rule and reign and the peace of God would surpass their understanding. Let it be their constant companion. Father, you'll have the final say in this and we cover them today in Jesus' name. Amen. One more thing as we're standing, if our kids have come forward, we want to pray over you guys and send you next door with Mr. Dale. Leanne and Reeve, while they're coming, I know you're listening this morning. We love you guys and we're standing with you. You won't fight it alone. Let's pray over them, guys. Father, in the name of Jesus, what an honor and a privilege to be a part of seeing the eyes opened of another generation to the greatness of our King. Lord, right now in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray for a fresh encounter with you. Lord, not just a lesson, but a fresh encounter with you. Lord, open all of our eyes that we can see. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit flow through our kids' ministry today, God. Lord, we ask that they will know you and settle it in, even at this age, Lord, as to who you are and what they're called to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We send you guys out. Have a great day, guys. You can be seated. What's up, homie? Ronnie, come on up, bro. Share this exhortation that the Lord laid on your heart. I really believe that's for somebody today. was a terrible decision. Woo! feel like I'm wearing Gore-Tex in the Sahara. Just woo! I really, there's not a time of year that long sleeves is a good decision for me. <sighs> Lord, we just... Mm, you're in this place and you're doing something new. Lord, old things have passed away, and all things are becoming new. We welcome you into this place, quieten our spirits to hear from you today, Lord. I think you got some blessings that you want to bestow upon your people today, or just a fresh empowerment from you. Lord, let me decrease, and I pray that you increase and get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Wednesday night at Worship and Warfare, I was sitting in the back where Larry's sitting back there, and God just really laid something on my heart that I just can't seem to get past. Man, I just feel His presence in this place today. There's a lot of churches right now a lot of God's people, a lot of collective families of God that are really in a struggle right now, especially the season we've been in in this country and culture that we live in. And I'm sure you've been asking a lot of these things yourself about your own home. 
Who are we? What are we doing? And where are we going? That's a question that's asked a lot of in times of struggle and difficulty. When it hits us, it brings us back to step one. And though it's an exciting season, because I really do feel like we're on the precipice of just something amazing from God. It's also one riddled with struggles and trials and fires that that just want to suck the life out of us as a people. I've been praying as pastor of this church over our local church here, praying about the DNA of who we are as a people. There was a time, and I know that God's brought me to this passage. You can be opening up to Joshua chapter 1. These people are in a very challenging place. But at the same time, it's one of great opportunity. They are right on the border of the promised land that God has for them. That he has spoken to them years and years and years ago. They're right on the cusp of it. But unfortunately, it's also been met with a great struggle. Moses, the great leader of Israel, has passed away. Think about that. Right on the border of promise, but living in the midst of struggle. As a matter of fact, he wasn't the only one that passed away. There had been a generational shift in Israel. God intentionally, because of their unbelief, waited for a generation to pass so he can bring them into this promised place. Will they arise to the challenge? Or will everything they've walked through up until that point be for naught? I've been asking the same thing about this church with where we are right now in 2020. This church is just a little over 50 years old. There's been great movements of God in this place. God has done something significant in this community through the branches of this church. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people have really been touched through this ministry, not just here, all around the world. But my question to you is the same as these people. Will we live on the border of the promise? Or will we give in to the struggle and let it defeat us right where we are? Apply that to your family. Apply that to your personal life. Apply it to this church. Who are we going to be and where are we going? God has given me a word, and I want to call these dangers of the dangers that we are facing today. These are all dangers that if we give in to, can take us away from the destiny that God has on this church. The first one is in Joshua chapter 1, and I in no way think we're going to get through all of these today. Although I said that last week, and I just preached longer, and we did. (laughs) I don't think we can do that today. I want to read this in Joshua chapter 1. Is everybody tracking with me this morning so far? How many people, just getting started, you want to say, I want the promise and what God has over this church and over my life. I want to to live in victory. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. Now, unfortunately, when something like that, that is super traumatic and painful, the last thing we want to do is arise. We want to sit, and we want to quit, and we want to stop. God hits him with that word in the beginning. This stinks. It's hard. He's led you for all these years. He led you up out of Egypt. You saw manifestations and miracles in the desert, but that's over now. What are you going to do about it? I'm telling you to arise. Arise and go over the Jordan, you in this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, the land of promise. 
He said, there's still a promise that's out there waiting. And I'm telling you, the same is true for us today, guys. It doesn't matter what's happened around us. We are still right on the border of a promise that God has for us. And I don't intend one more second for us to just sit and weep about where we've been. I intend for us to arise and step into what God has for us right on the other side of the river. I'm not waiting anymore. I don't want to sit around and have one more Facebook post coming from me about how terrible 2020 is. It's been rough, but let's get up. Let's arise. Let's step over the river that God has for us because there's a promise right on the other side. Who's with me this morning? Amen. He says, arise and go into this land. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given to you just as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates and the land of the Hittites to the great sea going down of the sun, it's going to be your territory and no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I shall be with you. I won't leave you and I won't forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, there it is again, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you can have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that according that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have success. Have I not commanded you, third time, be strong and courageous, don't be frightened and don't be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The first danger that's facing the church today And I'm telling you, I want you to think about this in relation to you. It's the danger of a lack of new leadership. It doesn't mean that the old leadership that's still present is irrelevant because they're not. But God tells Joshua this, I'm causing you to lead this in right now. And I want to tell you, I was talking to Wayne and Sandra about something this week, and I made the comment, and I've thought about this several times this week, how many funerals I've done in the last ten and a half years in this church since I've been the pastor. It has been unbelievable. The seats that are now empty that used to be full. Of not just church members, but of leaders and torchbearers of the Spirit that have led us as far as we've come. My question to you is, will you arise with me? Will we cross on over into what God has called us to be and called us to do? Or will we sit where the previous leadership had led us to? Something that's been told me my entire life. And I'm going to talk a lot about my father this morning and Brother Parrish and other leaders. But one thing that he has spoken to me my entirety of my life is if you don't stand on my shoulders and reach further than I did, then I failed you. I'm telling you guys, we are not to live on the foundation that's been built for us. We're to build higher and to go further. We're to step up and take it further than they ever led us. There's something that's waiting on us and it's a danger at this point in time to just live on the border of the promise because this is where Moses led us to. And God breaks it apart and he says, I'm not talking about Moses. That's gone now. I'm talking about you. Will you lead these people and be strong and courageous and lead them into what I promised that father generation? And I'm telling you guys, we have got to grasp it and hold on to it with everything that we are. We can't give up on the promise and the vision of this house right here because there's a promise for this place. 
One of my favorite movies of all, all time. I've seen it more than I've seen any other movie. Don't judge me in this. It's Braveheart. I'm a Scotsman. That's my ancestry. And it just like calls to me. It does, it, I mean, when my beard was out, that big red bushy beard, you know. And I could quote that movie to you. I've probably seen it 75 times since I was a kid. I just love the movie. And I love the accents, you know. And William Wallace, this guy in this clan, just steps up, man, and just absolutely is sick and tired of how the English are treating the Scots. And he's leading this crusade towards freedom. At the end of the movie, William Wallace is captured and killed. And at that time, you would think it's over. Scotland's going to remain under England's thumb. But that's not what happened. There's this other guy that steps up. And one of my favorite scenes is the last scene of that movie. And it's a guy that had had a lot of failures and flaws throughout the entirety of the movie. His name is Robert the Bruce. And he had, he had been a little conniver, just a little opportunist, and he, he wasn't painted in that great of a lie until the end. He refused for the cause to die. And he makes this statement. He says, you've bled with Wallace. I'm asking you, will you bleed with me? And he accomplished what his predecessor had set out to do. And I'm asking you the same thing in this church the cause still stands. There is a community out there that needs what God established Christian fellowship in this community to do. He has established this church for destiny and for purpose. He didn't put Brother Parrish here by accident in 1969. And it wasn't just so we could live from 1969 until 2020 and live on the corner of the promise not at all. There's something else for us to do. The great danger is that we begin to rest in the previous generation's accomplishments instead of going further. Where's the leaders today? That's the first danger I want to talk about. And much like the first, the second danger is this. It's a lack of vision. Joshua did not have that. As a matter of fact, Look in chapter 2, if you would. I'm not going to read as much there. Joshua, the son of Nun, after God established Joshua's leadership, the first act that he has is this. He sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, let's go view this land, especially Jericho. And they went and they came into the house of Rahab the prostitute and lodged there, which you know that story. I'm not going to read the rest of it. But what his first act was, was to draw a line of demarcation and say, we're not going to live here. And he established this vision as God says, there's a promise right on the other side of that river. And we are going to accomplish that. We're going to live on the other side of that because that's what God says that we can have. And the first thing that he does is get this vision from God and says, let's go look at that land because from here out, that's where my eyes are. We're going right over there. He did not stay in the place that the previous leadership took them to. He didn't live on the border of the promise. He cast a vision in front of everybody and he wrote it down and he said, here's where we are going. And that vision started sweeping across the church and you can feel the excitement building in the people of Israel and the encouragement. Yeah, that's ours. That's right. Yeah, we're going there. We're not going to stay here. We're going there. And his first act after assuming command was to send out spies and to take what was rightfully theirs, especially Jericho, the great walled city that seemed insurmountable. I love that phrase, especially Jericho. What seemed impossible, he says, that is mine. And he cast this vision out to everybody. It is a disservice to everyone that carried the torch before us just to sit down on the place where they led us to. I'm going to say that again. It is a disservice to everyone that carried the torch before us to just sit down on the place where they led us to. 
I got permission this morning and blessing from these folks to share this. I've shared this with just a couple of people, but I felt the Holy Spirit this morning tell me to share this. So bear with me. I had a dream, and I guess it's an indication I'm becoming an older man, because old men dreams dreams, but I had a dream, and it, it was the most spirit-filled moment of my life, and it came in a very dark time. After we walked through the month of May with my family and my dad's home going, and June was difficult, and most of you guys know we took July off in sabbatical and just grieved and processed. The first Wednesday night that I was back, I had a dream. And I walked through the foyer of that church, of this church. And I was alone until I walked through the foyer. And when I walked out into the foyer, there stood Jan Cowan. And for those of you that are new here, I mean, if you've been here any time at all, you know who Jan is. Jan went home to be with the Lord last November. And she was very special to my wife and I. But she was a key member of this church as well. She had a little following. She'd sit down when she'd come into the church. And I don't know, just one by one, people would surround her, you know, and that was just her ministry. She had her people. I walked out into the foyer of the church, and she means something in this dream. And when I said that I had permission to share this, I have shared this with Vivian, and I've shared it with Cliff as well, and they both said it's time. My eyes got enormous, and Jan, I, there's no words to explain how she looked. She was radiating. And my eyes got really big, and I said, Jan, what are you doing here? And she comes over to me like she's done a million times, and she pats me on the hand. And she always called me honey. She said, honey, I've come to check on you. And when she said that, I became keenly aware that I'm talking with someone that's been with Jesus. And all of a sudden, that's all I could think about. And I said, uh, have you seen Jesus? And she smiles from ear to ear, and she says, oh, I've seen him. And then the next question, I guess it shows where my heart is. I said, did you hug him? <laughs> and she said, it's the first thing that I did. And I said, Jan, I want to know everything. Tell me about the Lord. I want to hear it. Tell me about Jesus. And she just smiles from ear to ear. And she just shakes her head no. And she says, there's not a word I could use that you would understand. She said, I could try, but you wouldn't comprehend it. And when she said that, I got my eyes back on myself. And I hung my head. And I said, do you know everything that's been going on these last couple of months? And she says, honey, that's why I'm here. She said, you need to, be, you need to know that you're going to be okay and you're going to make it. And when she said that, she said, I want you to look at me and I want you to hear me. And then she said something that I would never forget the rest of my life. She says, I want you to hear me. She said, we're watching. And when she said that, I knew she was talking about my father. And when she said, we're watching... There was an intercom that went off in the foyer and this loud voice bellows peacefully when she says, we're watching. 
this loud voice just says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race with endurance that is set before us. And when that voice finished, I opened my eyes and I woke up from a dead sleep just tears streaming down my face in my bedroom, feeling pulsating waves of the Holy Spirit. And God spoke to me, and this is why I'm sharing this. He says, the time for looking back has ended. It's time to grab the torch, and it's time to run forward. And here's the voice. The grandstands of heaven are full. They've run their race, and they're cheering you on. And it's time to grab the torch, and it's time to move forward. I've shared that with just a few of you, but I felt like it was needed to be shared today. Just two days ago, I get a text message from Zach Strong, who's been a true brother and friend to me ever since I've been in the pastorate. And he's a true prophet of God. God's used him a lot to speak accurately in my life. This was just, uh, it was either Thursday or Friday. He says, I have to tell you this he said take it for what it's worth but the Lord says it's time to move forward and when he said that it's just like I was <sighs> and then Wednesday night you know what the Lord had spoke this word to me guys God's speaking something to this place today we've been led up to something but the greater question is will we have the boldness and the courage to take it further and go ahead and possess the promise we can't run the race of those before us, but we certainly can't stop when the baton's been slapped into our hands. There's still a job to be done. There's still a race to be run. And we're going to be held accountable on if we run it or not. And I'm telling you, we cannot sit on the border of a promise. We can't just hang out because it's been a tough season. God's word to us is just like it was to Joshua. Arise and go in and possess what I've told your fathers is yours to possess. Don't sit here any longer. It's time to get up. It's time to arise, church, and it's time to possess fully the victory and the destiny and the promise that he has over this house. We can lose our focus so quickly in the midst of trial. And it can become about something that it never was about in the first place. Where's the new generation of leadership? It's a danger if it's not there. The second danger that I see is a danger of a lack of vision just camping out in the land where you need to move from. Let's not drop that torch. Let's carry it further. Man, I feel the presence of God in this house today. Here's another danger in chapter 3. Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, and all the people of Israel, and they lodged there before they passed over. And at the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, get this, as soon as you see, man, as, you, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant, you need to get up and you need to follow it. That's the word. When the Ark of the Covenant passes by, get up and follow it. I'll tell you what the Ark of the Covenant represents to me. It represents the presence of God. Whew. The danger I want to talk about is this. When we're on the border of promise and we're in the culture that we're in today, when the church becomes agenda-driven and not presence-driven. It was always about the presence. Always about the presence. Even with the previous generation, Moses was the one who was led by the cloud by day and the fire by night. 
And there was times that others tried to encourage him to go on, and he says, oh, no, not until that cloud goes. Lord, if you don't go with us, I will plant myself right here. Because I ain't going past that. That's what it's about. And here they are to this generation. The ark is passing by, and he says, when that thing shows up, that's what it's about. Get up and follow it. Let me tell you, there is nothing that matters in church that is not centered around his presence and the pursuit therein. God wants to manifest himself right here, right now. He wants to heal. He wants to deliver. He wants to bring wholeness. And how many times has the church missed what it is God is trying to do because we're so captivated with what we want him to do instead or with what our agenda is. That's why we don't have an order of service because I don't have an order of service except to press into his presence. And when we come in contact with the manifested presence of God, that's why we're here. The rest of the service can go out the window. The video feed can cut. The song service can stop. We're here for the presence and nothing else. And if we've centered church around something else besides the pursuit of pressing into that holy of holies place, we've missed it, church. We build programs that don't even have a thought about the presence of God. We have services that don't even pause for a moment and say, God, what do you want to do right here? As a matter of fact, when King David came and somebody stole that little box, the Ark of the Covenant, oh, it was an agenda of his. We got to get that back. We got to get it back, guys. You know the story, and you know where I'm going. <laughs> He makes it his agenda to reestablish, hey, buddy, the presence. That's all that it's about. And he pursues it. And when he gets it, he comes into Jerusalem, and that dude starts celebrating. And people think he's an idiot. I can relate. <laughs> Unfortunately, for different reasons. His wife thinks he's a moron. I can relate. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding sometimes. <laughs> the presence comes back in to Jerusalem, and David starts dancing. And his wife yells at him, You look like a foolish person! And David disrobes himself. I'm not going to do that. Can I hear a hearty amen this morning? Although with this Gore-Tex shirt I'm wearing, it's a temptation. He starts dancing and pursuing all-out pursuit of the presence of God. It's a danger. When we're in these places like our culture is in right now, to make it about something other than that. And it's never been about anything other than that. And truthfully, I'm just going to be honest, this church doesn't have anything to offer you. There's not a program in this church that has one thing to offer you without his presence being there, man. And that's what made it so powerful when Jesus came. And he died on the cross. And you know the story of the crucifixion. But the most amazing thing happened when he breathed his last breath. There was a great earthquake and it shook the foundations of the earth. And more importantly, it shook the veil of separation between us and the Holy of Holies. And it ripped that curtain veil in two. And God said, come on in. Whew. 
And he made that place available to us. And how many times as his people in church, we've stopped short of entering into what God has welcomed us into. And we do it for a variety of reasons, other agendas. It might get weird and it makes me feel uncomfortable. It probably will. There's one thing that I understand about the presence of God is that I don't understand what it is. I just know it's His time. And He does what He wants to do. And when God shows up, man, that's what it's about. I'm telling you, there's healing in His presence. There's deliverance in His presence, guys. And if they're... If we stop short, what we're saying is, if you're bound up, demon-possessed, depressed, then you're going to leave that way. You ain't going to leave that way any longer. Man, his presence is everything. Joshua says, "Mm, follow that. You're sitting there minding your own business when you see that get up and have the wisdom to follow it. It's a danger, church. I want us to hold the line in this church in the midst of this culture because we live in a culture of division and disunity like the world has never seen. I mean, anything's possible. I could fully expect a church split at any given time over those wearing long sleeve and short sleeve this morning. (laughs) You know, I'm telling them, is it that far-fetched, really? Because, man, we've made it about so much else. I'm telling you why I am the way I am and where my heart is. I just want to pursue his presence and let everything else fall. We need a fresh movement of the Holy Spirit. Though Jesus himself had told his disciples, I got something for you to do. I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. He says there's something that's missing. You need to hang out in Jerusalem for a while because I got something that's going to help you do it. Man, the Holy Spirit falls and changes everything. It's a danger in a moment like today to make it about something other than the presence, and it's not. I'm going to do one more, and then we'll stop. Is that okay? Chapter 4. Here's a big danger. And it's kind of the opposing truth of the first. I'm not saying that what's led us up to this point is irrelevant because it's not. As a matter of fact, as they cross over the Jordan, God speaks to Joshua this. Have men, one from each tribe, take a stone and build them up as a memorial because there's going to be a day that your children come to you and say, what happened here? And you can recount what God did, how we walked through on dry land, and they built a memorial. Here's the danger, especially when the world is swirling around you. The danger is forgetting where you came from. Somebody led us to where we are. And our children need to know, man, this is hard. A couple of weeks ago, I found something in my desk. And it was a card. I was actually looking for a remote control to the TV. But instead, I found this card, and I had no idea what it was. I just threw it in there. I'm not a guy that 
saves a lot of cards. I'll just say it that way and move along. <laughs> Next, I think on my wife's birthday, just let's walk into Walmart, pick you one out and read it. And I mean every word of it, put it back. Let's move along. No, I'm not going to do that. That's not wisdom. I'd, stay, I'd like to stay married. But I found this card, and it was from my dad. And I had no idea what it was, or I don't know that I'd ever read it. Not too long before my father passed, and before quarantine, he gave me a gift, and it was his Bible. It was his father's Bible, and it was his grandfather's Bible. And I guess I was just so caught up in the moment that I didn't even read the card. I just put it in my desk, and I thanked him for the Bibles. It was before church. So I opened this card up, and I read it. <laughs> Man, it was so prophetic. And I'm going to share it with you. He says, son, I didn't know that I'd get another chance to give you this. Never forget where you came from and never forget who you are. You are the link between our history and our destiny. Those words have been branded in my spirit. Somebody got us to where we are. When I stand on this stage, I am keenly aware I did not build the stage that I stand on. When I walked through the doors of this church, I realized that I did very little to contribute this church being established. Never forget. We lose ourselves when we forget where we came from. And we forget who we are as people. And it's a danger in life. We see it this month on 9-11. You can look on Facebook every post. I mean, I share every year the bullhorn speech from Bush. I think that's the greatest presidential moment of all time. I, I, it just speaks to me. But picture after picture after picture after picture of the Twin Towers with two words. Never forget. You may be new in this place, but I want to establish some memorial stones this morning. I want to set up some stones on this stage. In the late 60s, there was a Southern Baptist preacher that had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and from his own mouth received the left foot of fellowship from his church. And he came with his brother, started out to be a series of meetings, ended up being a church in a flower shop in Draftonville. And it began to grow as the word was taught. And there was a phrase, and you see it on that sign out there in our coffee shop. It's one of the first church signs. I think it is the first church sign that was set up. And there became a phrase the distance is worth the difference. The, yeah, the difference is worth the distance. There you go. That makes more sense. The difference is worth the distance. The church grew and grew and grew. And that building behind us back there, the A-frame, was erected. It was the first church on this property here. And God just began to explode and bring in families mostly out of denominational churches, Methodist, Baptist, Church of Christ. This church was established on a hunger and a realization that there's something more 
As a matter of fact, I want to just ask, if you came to this church out of the Baptist denomination, would you just stand to your feet? Now, this is not a slam against any denomination. I'm just asking just to show something. All right, you can sit down. If you came out of the Methodist church during any season, would you stand to your feet, please? All right, have a seat. If you came out of the Lutheran church, would you stand to your feet? All right. What about Church of Christ? You can have a seat. What about Catholic? How many people were Catholic? This church, you can sit down, and many, many more. It was established... Because God started doing something here, and people, families started coming in by the droves from denominational churches, and people were getting saved at the same time because there was something different. And the church grew and flourished. In the early mid 80s, God spoke to our founding pastor, Brother Parrish, and his son David as well to establish the building that's next door to us, Christian Fellowship School. We talk about Christian Fellowship School in this place a lot. And you'll hear me say this phrase. It's main ministry that comes out of this church is Christian Fellowship School. Why is that a main ministry here in 2020? Because that's part of our DNA and we haven't forgotten where we've come from. And God has expanded our school, what started in small days, you know, just a handful of people, just growing and growing and growing. And God has done so much in our school, literally touched thousands of families in our school. Personally, I'm a graduate, 1995. (laughs) Scott, you were my youth pastor, so you're older than me. (laughs) It's why it's there, because God established that school. And I'm not worried about it going anywhere, because today, as much as it was in 1984, Jesus is Lord over CFS. That's his school. And we're going to keep devoting ourselves to it. Well, time endured, and a mission agency was set up in 1988 because God spoke to Brother David and Brother Parrish. And they began to handle funds of missionaries because of the exorbitant prices, administrative costs that different mission agencies were charging the missionary and taking the missionary's money. And Brother Parrish just and David both, like, this just shouldn't be so. So the church paid the administrative cost of that mission agency, and they began to, you know, handle funds of missionaries. And God expanded this church. We don't talk about it a lot from the pulpit, But world evangelization and world missions is in the DNA of this church. In the mid-90s, early 2000s, and I'm going to backtrack here in a second, there was a massive thrust towards world evangelization. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars came out of this church for the cause of global evangelization. And it's why it's in our heart. You know, we've never had massive, ornate facilities. It's because we give everything away. And that's why we are like we are. But God changed something significant in this church in the early 90s when a revival began to sweep across this church. Dramatic, powerful manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I mean... Unbelievable. That's when I came to the church. We came here in 1990, right in the height of the revival. And you still hear people talking about the 90s revival. Rightly so, because it was such a move of God that infused something into the DNA of this church. Sunday nights became a very powerful revival night. Oftentimes we would leave early, early in the morning, maybe not until the sun was up the next day because a hunger for the presence of God had taken up residence on the inside of everybody where nothing else mattered. We need a good dose of that again. We need a good dose of priority in this church again where nothing matters but the presence. 
And that fingerprint was pressed in on this church. Teaching centers began to pop up. I actually preached my first sermon at the Union City Teaching Center. Many of you went down there. It was a train wreck. It sure felt good, though. I studied six hours, had six pages of type notes, and I preached six minutes. <laughs> My, how times have changed. Some of you are like, God, bring us back, Lord. Take me back. <laughs> Pastoral transition happened in the mid-90s, 1995, and honestly, if you were part of that, it's the smoothest pastoral transition I've ever seen in my life, from Brother Parrish to his son, Brother David. And David began to really push every member ministry and really made us take step forward in missions. And David pastored this church for 13 years until he entered full-time missions ministry himself, and we're still joined at the hip. Though you don't hear the phrase world missions and evangelism every week, it's part of who we are in this church, and it always will be. 2010, God brought me in as the pastor of this church after a great internal and external struggle in February of 2010. These past 10 years have been fulfilling, but they sure haven't been easy. We've lost a large amount of torchbearers. Many have passed on. Many have moved on somewhere else. But our mission here is to always know where we've come from. God told Joshua there's going to be a time when your kids ask you, what happened here? And I went through that brief history lesson for a reason this morning. Because it's a danger in times when you feel like you're drowning and sinking to ask this question. Who am I? Who are we? Why are we here? What are we doing? Though we can't rest on it, it's important to always know where you've come from. And that phrase, I'm telling you, it is branded in me. Just like my dad spoke to me personally, I want to speak it over this church. We are the link between our history and our destiny. We, in this sanctuary, you're not just attending a church. You've become part of a movement. And there's a torch in your hand if you realize it or not. And it's very important. We can't rest on it. And visions may change. Methodologies may change. But our DNA and our mission as a church has remained the same through all these years. And I think it's important that we build us some memorial stones and realize this is who we are. Because that was so important to God that he let Joshua know, your kids have to know this. There's a book in the coffee shop out there and it's, little manual like this, 8 by 10, I think, with about that thick, and it tells the 50-year history of this church. If you don't have one of those, grab one of those out there. We want you to take one of those. <laughs> Scott's got a bunch left in his office. He's like, take, take a box. <laughs> it's important, and it's a danger. But I'm telling you, God's been dealing with me who are we as a church? It hasn't changed. It's the same. And our DNA is before us. It's like I was saying in the baptistry this morning. I'm, I, I hate this pandemic. I'm so sick of it. And I'll tell you this. It, even that, nor any other struggle, can keep us from being who God has called us to be. It's time to get down to business. It's time for a new generation of leaders to arise. It's time for fresh vision. Vision. I don't know what that was. Vision. To be in the heart of God's people. To not rest on where we are, but a hunger to go further. And I see it building. It's time.
time that we become presence driven and not agenda motivated. And it's time that we recognize why these memorial stones are there. We'll continue next week into chapter 5. But I'm telling you, a significant change has taken place in this church. And it's taken a change in me. And I want to affirm what Zach told me this week. It's time to move forward. You might see things that look different. We're hungry for the presence of God in this place. And I, don't, I know God's with us. I know he takes up residence on the inside of us. We take him wherever we go. We are the church. I know all that. I'm talking about the manifested presence of the Holy Spirit when God's people come together. The Bible says these signs will follow them who believe. I want to see some of those signs because I believe. I want to see some cultural shifts and changes take place right here where we are. And I am just grounded that Jesus is the only thing that can change culture. You'll hear a lot of things. Get involved in this. Get involved in this. Get in, and I'm not saying you shouldn't be. But our message is Jesus. Because Jesus has the power to change culture. Only Christ can change a heart. There's going to be a lot of things that are vying for the attention of Christians. But I'm telling you, you want to make a difference. Pursue the presence and invite people in. And God will change the heart. And then we have this grassroots effort that changes this culture, man. I've seen, and I, I used to be do this more than I do now, but read about revivals and stuff. There's stories of genuine revivals taking place and them shutting the jail down in town because the revival was so huge. Nobody was doing anything wrong. It's awesome. I mean, I, I'm, I support our police force. Don't misunderstand me, but I'd love it if they didn't have anybody to watch because God was shaking them to the core, you know? Marriages have been hit at an unprecedented level in these last year. It's put a fingerprint on stuff. I'm sick and tired of it, and it's time for God to arise and our homes to align under what God says we are. The enemy is having his say but not any longer. It's time for the church to arise. I'm going to keep my word and end, and we'll continue next week. I don't even know how to end. I can pray. How do you end something like this? God, establish your word. Establish, reestablish the DNA of what you've positioned us here to do. Lord, over 50 years, something's been happening in this place, and it's not about this place at all. It's about the kingdom. We're not going to make it about a church because we're not trying to build a church. We're trying to build a kingdom. Lord, set us on fire. I'm sick of mundane religious gatherings, Father, that is devoid of any type of discernible presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm here for you. And I know everyone else is too, Lord. We're not going to camp out on the other side of the Jordan any longer. Even if it looks difficult like Jericho did, that's ours. That is ours. It's ours. A torch has been slapped 
in the hands of everybody here, Father, from people that have carried it for years. It's time to carry it forward. You've prophetically spoke that to me. This week, you gave me a dream that I knew was from you. Your word is clear. It's time to move forward. Lord, you've spoke it multiple times. Forward, 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 forward. Don't let us forget who we are and where we came from. But stop letting us live there. Lord, I invite the manifested presence of the Holy Spirit in this place right now. You've not called us to be an impotent church. You've not called us to be powerless. And it's not about us. It's about what we're attached to. Oh, Lord. Manifest your presence here in Christian fellowship again. Lord, may the blind have sight. May the deaf ears be opened. May the lame run. Anything that would rise its head against what God says we can have, may it be vanquished under the power of the Holy Spirit. May marriages be healed and restored and reconciled. May bondages be broken. May addictions be just obliterated to smithereens, Father, under the power of your presence. Pass in front of us this morning, Lord, and we'll follow. Just like Joshua told the children of Israel, when you see that, you get up and go. Lord, you are the reason we're here. I'm not here for an institutional church that I get a paycheck from. I'm here to encounter you. I'm not here to have a service that makes people feel comfortable. Lord, we need you. And we welcome you, Lord. Forward, forward, forward. Thank you, God. Seal your work and seal your word this week, Father. Get us all in that same place. I believe that's what you're doing. Establish it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.